This is a message on understanding salvation, and the purpose is for us to have a deeper grasp of what has taken place if, in fact, we have come to that place in our lives where we've become Christians. Uh, the way I'd like to begin this is maybe posing a question to you of how you might have responded in the situation that I was in recently. Um, it was actually a couple of years ago, I had some very severe pain in my back, and the doctors determined that what I needed was a series of three injections in my spine. Yes, I know that's serious and painful. And I was quite scared, and the doctor, wanting to try to alleviate some of my fears, would pose questions to me. The first time I came in for the first injection, oh, Mr. Newman, what do you do for a living? And I talked about the fact that I work for a Christian organization. And uh, then the second time, two weeks later, and, you know, how's business or how are things going? And uh, I was just as scared the second time. And, of course, they, they try to ask you these questions right as they're about to put a needle in your spine because they think that that will distract you and it won't hurt. doesn't work. Um, so then the third time, they thought, for sure, by now I'm just uh, calm as could be. The doctor's behind me with his needle. The nurse is in front of me with her hand on my shoulder trying to comfort me. And uh, they had found out that I do religious things for a living. And so the doctor said, you know, um, when I was in high school, I went to this church. Uh, this friend of mine invited me to his, his church, and all they did was talk about hell. If you danced, you were going to hell. If you drank, you were going to hell. If you smoked, you were going to hell. And he's telling me all this, and I'm hunched over a pillow, um, hoping not to die, and uh, having the nurse comfort me. And I'm thinking, I can't believe he's talking about this now. And then he, he said to me, you know, there's all these rules and all of this. Well, Mr. Newman, what do you think about that? And I'll tell you exactly what I thought about that. I thought, not now. I don't want to talk about this now. I don't, I don't want to talk about Jesus. I want to talk to Jesus. Oh, Jesus, keep me alive. And uh, so I, I blurted out something like, well, you know, uh, I, I'd really love to talk about this, but right now I'm just a little preoccupied. And he said, oh, of course, sure. Yeah, we could talk about this after I'm done. Um, and so... Uh, few minutes. So I had a few minutes to sort of compose in my mind, how, how am I going to answer this question? What, how do I clarify what it is that I believe to someone who thinks that what I believe is just a bunch of silly rules? If you do this or if you don't do this, or if you don't do this, you're going to go to hell. So I had a time to compose an answer, but before I tell you what I said, let me ask you, how would you respond? What would you say if someone wanted to know what it is that you believe? They even use the word salvation. What would, how would you help them understand what that concept means? Now, just to bother you a little bit, I'm going to tell you how I answer that question at the end of this message. In between, I want us to look at a passage of Scripture that I think helps us understand this and dig into it in a deeper way. So, if you have a Bible, I'd love for you to open up to Titus chapter 3, and we're going to look at verses 3 through 8. Titus 3... 3 through 8, and we're going to ask, what is this salvation that we have? How can we better understand salvation? So listen to God's word from Titus chapter 3. At one time, we too were foolish, disobedient, deceived, and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. But when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, He saved us, not because of righteous things we had done, but because of His mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that, having been justified by His grace, we might become heirs having the hope of eternal life. This is a trustworthy saying, and I want you to stress these things so that those who have trusted in God may be careful to devote themselves to doing what is good. These things are excellent and profitable for everyone. Now, I think you get from the tone of this that this is a, this is a core message of the Apostle Paul writing to Titus. Um, he says that these things are important, these are foundational, these are the things you must know. I want to look at uh, three things in this passage that help us understand our salvation in a deeper way. But before that, I want to point out something that may just seem so obvious, but it's worth thinking about. Why is it that a passage like this appears in a book like this? This is a letter to Titus. Titus was a pastor. 
He was a Christian already. He was a mature Christian. He'd been a Christian for quite a while. His task was um, building up a church and establishing elders and leaders. And so um, this is a, an explanation of the gospel message to a person who already knew it. Uh, and by the way, this isn't the first time in this very short book that Paul spells out or unpacks the gospel. In the introduction to the book, where Paul usually has a, a kind of a standard formula, I, Paul, and he has a short little description about himself, to whoever the church or the person is, and a little description, and then he says grace and peace. In this case, in Titus, which may be um, the longest introduction of any of Paul's letters, he says Paul, and he calls himself a servant, an apostle, and then he gives a long description about the faith that he has. So it's not so much about Paul, and it's not so much about Titus, it's about this message, this gospel message. That's the first time. In the second chapter, he unpacks the gospel a second time. So three times in a very short book, Paul is telling Titus, a man who already understands salvation, that he doesn't want to just assume that he has it and he wants him to understand it better. So the point is that all of us, no matter how long we've been a Christian, still need a deeper reflection, deeper understanding, a deeper grasp of what our salvation is. So, uh, look at the fact that he begins on a rather negative note. At one time, we were foolish, disobedient, deceived, and enslaved. Um, we, had, uh, we lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. Eight descriptions about how bad we were. And, and my point is, if we're really going to understand salvation, we have to understand how bad our sin is. Most of us tend to underestimate how bad our sin is. Paul doesn't allow that. Paul gives a description about how bad our sin is that is far worse than we tend to think, but he's right. Uh, you know, I've, I've led quite a few small group Bible studies, and uh, one of the things I like to do sometimes in a, in a small group setting is uh, just get people to get to know each other a little bit. And if they're all Christians, um, I'll say, all right, listen, let's go around the room, and I want people to uh, describe their lives uh, before they were Christian and after they were Christian. And what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to list three adjectives to describe your life before you were a Christian and three afterward. And, and it's a very good way to get to know each other and hear each other's stories. It might take a while to do so. Um, but people, I, I've done this quite a few times, and people say things like, um, I just was confused, and, and now I, I understand. I, um, I was mixed up, and, and now I, I don't feel mixed up. Uh, I was searching for something, now I feel like I've found it. Those are the kinds of things they say. And I don't doubt that, um, but nobody in all of my experience has ever said, I was foolish, I was disobedient. No one has ever used the word enslaved. Um, no one ever used the word malice. I mean, these words are a whole lot worse than we tend to say. We tend to underestimate how bad our sin is. Um, let's just unpack this a little bit. I, I hope you see there's two lists of four. Uh, the first list all seem to affect us individually, foolish, disobedient, deceived, and enslaved. And I think there's even a, a bit of a progression to it. Do you feel it? Uh, foolish, I, I, I made decisions that were just bad decisions. I bought into arguments that I probably shouldn't have bought into. I thought I was uh, exempt from uh, the laws of uh, consequence. I was foolish. Um, but it wasn't just foolish in a neutral sense, it was disobedient. I knew some of those rules, and I chose to disobey them. I knew what was right or what was good, and I chose what was wrong and what was bad. And then that led to the point where I would be deceived, um, not just thinking that something was okay, but I, I actually thought it was good when in fact it was bad. And it's quite possible that sin can have the effect that it actually enslaves. It doesn't just deceive, but it enslaves. Um, but then notice it starts affecting our relationships with other people. This isn't just an individual problem. It starts working itself out in relationships with malice and envy, hating one another and being hated. It just gets worse and worse. And so what I'm trying to say is if we're really going to understand salvation, I know that I'm, I'm laboring this point, but... But it's a point that needs um, uh, kind of, we need to break down resistance. So I'm trying to say we tend to underestimate how bad our sin is. Um, let me offer a uh, quote from C.S. Lewis. 
about this whole thing that might help you understand it. It's a bit of a long quote, but I hope you can hang in there with me. It's from his essay on forgiveness. And listen carefully to what he says. I find that when I think I am asking God to forgive me, I am often in reality, unless I watch myself very carefully, asking Him to do something quite different. I am asking Him not to forgive me, but to excuse me. But there is all the difference in the world between forgiving and excusing. Forgiveness says, yes, you have done this thing, but I accept your apology. I will never hold it against you, and everything between us two will be exactly as it was before. But excusing says, well, I see that you couldn't help it, or you didn't mean it. You really weren't to blame. And then Lewis adds, if one was not really to blame, then there's nothing to forgive. In that sense, forgiveness and excusing are almost opposites. Are you following this? Listen, he goes on. If you had a perfect excuse, you would not need forgiveness. If the whole of your actions needs forgiveness, then there was no excuse for it. But the trouble is that what we call asking God's forgiveness very often really consists of us asking God to accept our excuses. Listen, what leads us into this mistake is the fact that there usually is some amount of excuse, some extenuating circumstances. And we're very anxious to point these things out to God and to ourselves that we're apt to forget the very important thing. That is the bit left over, the bit which the excuses don't cover, the bit which is inexcusable but not, thank God, unforgivable. Did you catch it? Our sin is so bad, it needs forgiveness. It doesn't just need improvement. A lot of time I catch myself and I've done something that's sinful and, I, and my first thought is, I just need to be more careful. I just need to remind myself of these things. Um, I have a phone that can buzz me and remind me of all sorts of things. I think on, on very deceived moments, I think if I just program in enough reminders, then I won't sin. Love your neighbor. Uh, it, it won't work. I need something more transformational than just reminders and a better memory. So that leads to the second thing. Not only do we tend to underestimate how bad our sin is, but we tend to underappreciate how good the gospel is, how good our salvation is. Look at what Paul tells Titus. Again, someone who already knew this. He wants to remind him. Look at verse 4. When the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, He saved us not because of righteous things we had done, but because of His mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out on us generously. Do you feel all of this extreme uh, language He's using? The gospel is so good because it is this, the display of God's loving kindness, God's compassion, God's full expression of His love. He pours it out on us. Um, and, and it's not based on what we do. I'm sure you caught that. It's not based on us earning it. It's based totally on His graciousness. Did you catch that one form of the word saved or Savior is mentioned three times in this? When the kindness of love our God, our Savior appeared, He saved us, and then a little bit later on again, He calls Jesus Christ our Savior. Again, we don't just need improvement. We don't just need reminders. We need saving, where um, uh, in, in another passage in Ephesians chapter 2, uh, Paul reminds us that we were at one time dead in our transgressions. We weren't just sick. We weren't just misinformed. We weren't just confused. We were dead, and we need rebirth. We need to be awakened from death, brought into life. In Colossians, he says, we're brought from darkness to light. And part of, I think, a, grow, a way we can grow as Christians is to take the time to just deeply reflect on how good our salvation is, how good it is that God sent His Son to deliver us out of our hopeless state. If you're familiar at all with um, some literature that may come out of uh, Redeemer Presbyterian Church in New York City, here's what their literature says is the gospel, the way they uh, state it in their literature. Uh, the gospel tells us we're more wicked and sinful than we ever dared believe. But in Christ, we're more loved and accepted than we ever dared hope. 
We're more wicked and sinful than we ever dared believe, but in Christ we're more loved and accepted than we ever dared hope. It needs to grab a hold of us in a way. So many of us, I think, um, get to the point in our Christian life where we know it's true, but it has, it, it has ceased to move us in an emotional kind of way. And I think a deep time of reflection and meditation can help bring that to the surface. So, um, there's a third thing, though. So we, we tend to underestimate how bad off we are. We tend to uh, uh, underappreciate how good the gospel is. Third is, we tend to under-experience gospel transformation. Uh, first, let me show it to you here. It all flows after the so that in verse 7. God did all of this stuff. He saved us. He washed us. He, re- he renewed us. He pours out uh, uh, His salvation on us so that having been justified by His grace, we might become heirs, having the hope of eternal life. That word become is very important. We might actually become different kinds of people. We might experience transformation. We would become people who really are more patient, more kind, more loving, more accepting of people, less judgmental, less harsh. Um, It's not supposed to be just something we know here. It's supposed to be something that changes us and makes us different kinds of people. Um, Perhaps you're familiar with John Ortberg's book, The Life You've Always Wanted. Uh, It's uh, basically a book about how the um, uh, spiritual disciplines in our lives can help transform us, how we apply the gospel in a way that makes us into different kinds of people gradually. And uh, he tells a story at the beginning of the book that I think is really quite sad. He tells a story about somebody named Ralph. I'm assuming he's made up the name. Ralph was this guy who had been a Christian for a very long time, very active member in his church. He was always there. He would help out with setting up the chairs. He would be the one handing out bulletins before the worship service, always there to help, always rather unhappy. And in fact, anybody who knew him, had known him for a long time, um, would, would just sort of shrug their shoulders when he was kind of mean-spirited or nasty or disrespectful. And they would just sort of say, oh, well, that's just Ralph. That's just the way he is. He's always been that way. And Ortberg says that this story is a double tragedy. First of all, it's the tragedy that Ralph had never changed. He had known the Savior for decades and yet that had never made any kind of change. But what Ortberg says is even worse is that the second tragedy is that the vast majority of the people in his church never expected that he would change. That is not the way it's supposed to be. There's supposed to be an ontological change, a change of being. It says that we might become different kinds of people. If you're familiar with 2 Corinthians 5, 17, it says, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. It's a whole different change of being. And that's what's supposed to take place. And and so so this message called understanding salvation really isn't the, the ultimate goal of this message. It isn't just that we want to understand salvation. We want salvation to transform us. So let me come back to my... uh, spine doctor story. What did I say to him after he uh, stuck this needle in me? Um, He had said, you know, if you dance, if you drank, if you smoke, Mr. Doom, what do you think about all those rules? So I said to him, you know, I think we like rules. I think we like having a list of do's and don'ts. It serves all sorts of things for us. If we do them, we feel really good about ourselves. If we know other people who don't do them, it helps us feel really bad about them. But I said, you know, the stuff I need forgiveness for, it's a whole lot worse than that stuff you put on your list. It's a whole lot worse than dancing and drinking and smoking. Uh, the stuff I need forgiveness for are things like anger and bitterness and judgmentalism and, and hating people. And, and as I'm telling this, the doctor's eyes and the nurse's eyes are just getting wider and wider. And I was thinking, I'm just getting started. Uh, it's, go- it, it's far worse. Uh, but um, they, they were listening. And I said, you know, the, the, the stuff I need forgiveness for is so much worse. But that's what I love about Christianity, I said to them. That's exactly what I have. I have forgiveness for that kind of stuff. 
and not just forgiveness, but a force that can change me from the inside out. And uh, they were listening. Now, both of them had said they had heard some of this kind of stuff before, but I don't think they'd heard it like that. And, and my, I, I haven't seen them anymore. I don't know what they've thought or what they've gone on to believe. But I think the more we reflect on how good this salvation is, it won't just be uh, questions we can answer. It'll be a force for transformation to change us and to make us into different kinds of people, more and more like the one who saved us. Randy Newman has just raised our awareness of the gift of salvation. It's an amazing gift that boggles our mind when we come to contemplate all the things that God has done to bring about our salvation. He's freed us from sin and death and given us eternal life. C.S. Lewis wrote this. He said, To be a Christian means to forgive the inexcusable because God has forgiven the inexcusable in us. Now that's a statement that gives us pause to think. We live in a world of microwaves and sound bites and quick fixes. But as Randy has shared with us, our book, the Bible, is a big book. It's full of great descriptions of salvation and all that God has done for us in the world. Our salvation isn't something to be taken for granted or just tossed aside lightly. But it's something we need to reflect upon and think about. And so I challenge you this week to reflect upon your salvation. Talk about it with others. Read about it in Scripture. And begin to contemplate the many different words that are that describe our salvation in Scripture, whether it's adoption or redemption or salvation. And as you do, I think that you'll only gain a greater appreciation for the work that God has done and want to offer Him thanksgiving and praise for the amazing gift of our salvation. <music>